For almost 50 years, researchers have been unable to get to the truth of the matter. Did a flying saucer, some kind of unearthly spacecraft, crash near Roswell, New Mexico, early in July of 1947? Has the U.S. government recovered it and kept it hidden all these years? And what of the occupants, if any? What happened to them? Does the U.S. government really know what fell from the sky that night? And if they do, will they admit it? And why, after 50 years, do UFO researchers still say it's crucial that we learn the truth? Captain Kevin Randall has committed years of his life to the task of discovering this truth and has written several exhaustive studies on the events at Roswell. As an enduring mystery should, it all began on a stormy night in the summer of 1947. The story that's been told is that Mac Brazel was alone at the ranch in early July 1947, heard a a uh, clap of thunder that sounded much louder, different than the normal claps of thunder. Didn't think too much of it that night. The next day, he was out on the range looking to see which fields had gotten the rain the night before because he was going to move the livestock. And as he explored the fields, he came to an area that was filled with uh, metallic debris. Captain Randall and many others have said that the pieces of debris that Mac Brazel discovered were like nothing else on Earth. Mac Brazel then decided to bring the matter to the attention of the authorities. So he left the ranch and drove the few miles into the nearest town, Roswell, New Mexico. The sheriff of Roswell at the time was George Wilcox. His granddaughter, Barbara Duggar, recalls the story. Uh, in the 40s, there was a spacecraft, a flying saucer is what the monk called it, uh, crashed outside of Roswell. My grandfather went out there to the site when he got out there, there was a big burned area, and then they saw debris. I asked her, I said, did he see any little space beings? And she said, yes, there was four of them. The sheriff, according to reports, immediately got in touch with the nearby Army Air Base about the field of strange debris. It was only a short time before officers were on the site and eager to see exactly what Sheriff Wilcox was talking about. After all, a field full of debris is one thing, but actual beings from outer space? What happened next was either the biggest error or the biggest cover-up in the history of the Air Force. Major Jesse A. Marcel, the Air Intelligence Officer of the 5 and 9th Bomb Group, was told by Colonel Blanchard to go out and take a look at the scene himself. Marcel got out there again, saw an area that he described himself as three quarters of a mile long, two to three hundred feet wide, filled with metallic debris. He showed it to Colonel William Blanchard, the commander of the 509th Bomb Group. Blanchard ordered a press release saying that the Army had captured a flying saucer, talked to Lieutenant Walter Hott. Hott issued the press release, wrote the press release, and took it to the various media outlets in Roswell, the two radio stations, the two newspapers. And it, from that point, it went over the wire. The release read, in part, the many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers. But there was no mention of the space beings the sheriff told his family he had seen. Was this the beginning of a giant hoax or a giant cover-up? Barbara Duggar's grandmother was still afraid of the repercussions 40 years after the event. She said, the reason that I'm telling you this is because when the incident happened, the military police came to the courthouse they told George and I that if we ever told anything about this incident, talked about it in any way, that not only we would be killed, but the family, that they would, cut, they would get the rest of the family. But if the Air Force had already admitted publicly that they had in their possession a flying saucer, why threaten a local official and his family if they didn't keep silent? And according to Bill Brazel, Mac's son, his father was also sworn to secrecy. Secrecy about what? Had Mac Brazel found something more than just a field littered with strange debris? This is basically the point where we, the Roswell incident becomes a whole series of different mysteries, and they kind of crisscross one another. Because if Colonel Blanchard admitted they had a more or less intact flying saucer, then clearly somewhere they had more than just the small bits of metallic debris reported by Mac Brazel. According to many who were in Roswell at the time, the result was a tremendous flood of worldwide attention focused on the small New Mexico town. But what happened next seems to have been even more mysterious. Three hours later, the official story changed. 
General Roger Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force, the parent organization of the 509th Bomb Group, issued another press release saying it was nothing more than a weather balloon. According to General Ramey, the balloon had uh, crashed on the ranch. That's what Major Marcel found. He had overreacted thinking that he had a flying saucer. It was just this weather balloon and the ray wind target reflector. Is it possible that this photograph was a total fabrication? Here's what the officer on the right, General Thomas DuBose, now says about this Army Air Force press release claiming the crash was just a weather balloon. Um, we knew that it was a cover story, and, and if, whose idea it was, I, I have the biggest, the biggest idea, but we used that in order to, uh, to persuade the curiosity of the press. Why? Why would representatives of the U.S. military announce that the debris was from a weather balloon if senior officers knew otherwise? Maybe Mac Brazel did find a balloon, but the problem with this is it never explains all the other testimony. It does not explain all the debris. Recently, Major Marcel's son has come forward to tell an amazing story he remembers from his childhood having to do with that same debris. Major Marcel brought some of the material home so they could show it to his wife and his son. Then later on, he took all of that material back to the Roswell Army Airfield. Found that stuff scattered all over the countryside. The thing that set this apart from anything that I had ever seen before or since was the uh, marking zone parts of the wreckage. The, in the I-beam structural members, there was uh, like a writing of, of sorts. Uh, I remember at the time thinking this was like hieroglyphic, but uh, it wasn't really hieroglyphic, but it was more of a... Uh, uh, geometrical forms and symbols. Still, the weather balloon explanation could easily have been the end of what we know of the Roswell incident. But there were about to be even more startling discoveries when UFO Diaries returns. What has kept the Roswell incident a matter of heated controversy even today? One reason is the story told by this man, Grady Barnett, a civil engineer living in Roswell at the time. Grady Barnett told his friend Vern Malte about what he saw that July afternoon. Mr. Barnett told me that he'd, and when he was on a, coming back on one of his field trips, he'd run out to a flying saucer that had burst open, and there were four beings on the ground. Four alien beings, as well as an almost intact spacecraft. The number of beings coincides exactly with what Sheriff George Wilcox said he found. Civil engineer Grady Barnett claims to have seen a crashed flying saucer and the dead occupants of that craft. Can this be the same craft that the Army Air Force later claimed to have in its possession? But if Grady Barnett's flying saucer was almost entirely intact, what accounts for the massive amounts of debris discovered by Mac Brazel? And there was something else. Barnett said all the beings he saw were dead. Sheriff Wilcox, told a slightly different story. And Granddaddy said their heads were large, and the little suit that they had on was just, you, you couldn't, it was just like um, silk or something. And I asked her, I said, Is, were the little men alive, or if they did? And she said, I think of one of them was alive. Could it be there were two flying saucers instead of just one, each carrying a crew of four? Some UFO researchers believe that this is the only explanation. By all accounts, the debris was all very small. If these were pieces of a craft of some kind, it must have been totally obliterated. Based on first-hand accounts of other people who were involved, it's clear that the solution to the mystery was going to be found miles away from the Brazel Ranch, much closer to Roswell. Since the vessel was made of such super strong material, whatever destroyed it must have been a tremendous force. And what about the material found at the Mac Brazel Ranch? By all accounts, the debris was clearly not something from this earth. Uh, the material discovered at the debris field uh, defied all attempts of the people to explain what it was. The foil could not be cut. The wood-like material couldn't be whittled. It couldn't be burned. So clearly we have material that is not like anything that was available in our society in 1947. Is it possible that the pieces of debris found on the ranch were really something quite natural? For example, could they have come from a meteorite? 
Well, a meteor would enter the Earth's atmosphere at, uh, of course, very high speed. And once it meets the resistance of the Earth's atmosphere, it begins to burn up and uh, lose, of course, its size. And what's more, a meteor that landed with an audible impact would have left a gigantic impact crater, such as the one in Arizona. Whatever struck the ground in New Mexico left no crater. Did create a gouge in the uh, terrain, but that's more suggestive of some kind of a controlled crash than uh, something falling out of the sky. Some have suggested then that the debris could easily have been the wreckage from a top secret spy plane. During the late 1940s, the former Soviet Union was very curious about American nuclear bomb experiments, which were conducted only 100 miles from Roswell. A spy plane trying to capture these secrets would logically fly to that part of the country. The Soviet Union had nothing of the kind in 1947. In fact, using freedom of information, we checked to see if any Soviet aircraft had penetrated the coastal defense zones in 1947. Absolutely no evidence of any Soviet attempts to fly any kind of aircraft inside the United States in that time frame. But UFO researchers have recently discovered that the Soviet Union did have an interest in Roswell. That amazing story when we return. George Knapp recently returned from a trip to the former Soviet Union. He discovered that the Russians had a very high level of interest in the events of Roswell in 1947, and they came to some startling conclusions. We met a scientist while we were in Russia that, who worked under a guy named Sergei Korolov, who's the father of Russian rocketry. And Korolov had told this doctor about his meeting with Joseph Stalin in, late in the late 1940s. Stalin had an intense interest in UFOs. And one of the things he wanted to know about was Roswell. At the time, the late 40s, Roswell, New Mexico, was a hotbed of Russian espionage activity because we had so many secret military programs there. So they heard about Roswell and they were curious about it. And he had his scientists and his spies study it, and the conclusion they came up with was that Roswell was real, that something really did crash there, that it wasn't a weather balloon, and it wasn't anything of earthly origin. They didn't know exactly where it came from, but they knew it wasn't ours and it wasn't theirs, and this was something that uh, was of monumental importance that needed to be studied. Still at the center of this story was the man who had, in a sense, started it all, Mac Brazel. Brazel was a virtual prisoner at the ranch. If this is true, then it would seem the army feared he might tell others the truth about what he'd seen. Then, another unexpected development in the Roswell incident. The story of the Roswell incident took a remarkable turn when, as witnesses claim, Mac Brazel escaped from the army and headed straight for the people he knew he could trust. His friends at radio station KGFL in Roswell would later tell how they hid Brazel at one of their houses. We offered him a place to stay that night so he could get away from a lot of people with questions. The plan had been to broadcast an interview with Mac Brazel. But Judd Roberts tells us that he'd gotten a number of phone calls from Washington, D.C. that prevented them from broadcasting the interview. The suggestion was made to us that if we wanted to keep our, our license, we would not use the interview on the air because that would give us about 24 hours to find something else to do beside the radio business. Can this really be true? Did the U.S. Army use coercive tactics to ensure Mac Brazel's silence? And if so, his silence about what? But while at the base, he was virtually a prisoner. We know that he was kept at the guest house uh, under guard, which is not exactly being in jail, but it's basically the same thing. On the evening of July 9th, the military took Mac Brazel to the various media outlets in Roswell, and here he was telling them a story that differed significantly than what he had told them on July 6th. What I found yesterday in my field was a weather balloon. What? 
What happened to Mac Brazel during the time he was in custody? Why did he change his story? Perhaps the truth is that Mac Brazel planned to reveal the same remarkable story later told by mortician Glenn Dennis. In 1947, Glenn Dennis worked at the Ballard Funeral Home. In small towns, often the hearse doubled as an ambulance, and Glenn Dennis would have an opportunity to drive injured airmen back out to the base. Once he arrived at the hospital and escorted the airmen into the emergency room, he had an opportunity to see some of the metallic debris that had been collected on the debris field in the back of ambulances as he walked by them. It looks like you've had a crash. I said, I see some debris in, in the ambulances there. And that's probably where I really got in trouble, right there. Excuse me, sir. This is private property. No looking. Hey, hey. You know, what do you guys got there? Don't you worry about what, what we got there. You say one word to anybody, and you're dead. Get him out of here. Okay, Glenn was told in very blunt language that if he ever talked about this, if he went into town and told his friends about it, he'd be killed. But Glenn Dennis's connection to the Roswell incident did not end there. He would soon learn much more from his girlfriend, a nurse at the base hospital. And this was a young uh, second lieutenant, a uh, very deeply religious lady. She was uh, raised, born and raised in a very strict Catholic family. She was going into this examination room that was across the hall. She was going in to get some supplies, and when she walked in the door, there was two doctors there. She started out the door and said, you stay here, we've got to have you. And what it was, they were examining, uh, she told me, three bodies, foreign bodies. And she said two of them were very mutilated. Uh, that was then, she said, I've got to go back to the barracks. He said, I am deathly ill and I've got to go back to the barracks. And then that was the last time I ever saw her. The next day, I called out. I wanted to see how she was doing and how she was feeling. And they said that she'd been transferred out. And they didn't know where, but she was no longer there at, at the air base. What happened to the nurse who was pressed into duty on that fateful July day? Did she see, perhaps even work on, the bodies described by Sheriff Wilcox? Could this really have happened? And if so, are the bodies even related at all to the debris found by Mac Brazel? If this is the real solution to the Roswell mystery at last, it unfortunately only raises other equally difficult questions. If there were two saucers, or one that broke into two pieces, where are all of those pieces now? And if the alien pilots really were taken away from the crash site, what became of them? Sappho Henderson, the widow of an Air Force pilot flying out of Roswell at the time, claims to have the answer. I guess if they're putting in the papers now, it's no longer a top secret. And he said, he bought the papers, and we went to the car, and he said, read those. And I read the article, and he said, it's a true story. He said, not only did I know about it, but I'm the pilot that took the crashed saucer to Dayton, Ohio. Was undeniable proof of extraterrestrial life carefully transported to Dayton, Ohio, and hidden away? In a moment, amazing answers when UFO Diaries returns. Even if it were possible to piece together the truth about the Roswell incident, can we somehow prove once and for all what really happened? Or has the evidence been locked away where the general public could never find it? We know enough about what happened to realize the government collected everything. They policed the area, they gathered the craft, they gathered the bodies, they picked up everything. The best evidence is that the spacecraft and the bodies were collected in Hangar 84 at the Roswell Army Airfield, and that they were then sent to other bases around the country. We know, based on, again, good testimony, that a preliminary autopsy was held at the base hospital. The nurse that Glenn Dennis knew said that she saw three bodies inside the base hospital. So we know three of them were at the hospital at one time. What we have are a large number of people, many of whom are unknown to one another, telling the same basic story from different points of view, from Mac Brazel on the debris field to the men, such as Major, Major Edwin Easley, who was on the impact site, telling a story that dovetails nicely. If it was a hoax, we would not have 
the corroborative testimony that has been offered by these people. The Roswell incident seems to be a mystery that will never fully be explained unless more of the original eyewitnesses break the decades of silence. It does seem there's been an elaborate cover-up, lasting almost half a century and employing methods that may have at times been brutal. But could the wall of silence around the Roswell incident finally be breaking down? Will the government soon release the whole truth exactly as it happened? After numerous requests from his constituents, New Mexico Congressman Steve Schiff has asked the U.S. Department of Defense for an official explanation of the events of July 1947. In March of 1993, New Mexico Congressman Stephen Schiff began an attempt to break through the wall of secrecy that's been hiding this event. But he was answered only by an Air Force colonel who claimed that the Department of Defense keeps its documents from that era on file in the National Archives and that Congressman Schiff should contact them. A search of the archives only produced another mystery. Congressman Schiff eventually got a response from the National Archives, which said generally that they had no in information in the archives about the events now known as the Roswell Incident. Apparently, in the eyes of the Defense Department, the Roswell Incident simply did not happen. Why are there no records of what numerous witnesses claim they saw? A military operation carried out on private property. The Blue Book files contain absolutely no information about Roswell with the exception of a single paragraph and a single newspaper clipping in another file. So Congressman Schiff felt that, that response from the military, from the National Archives, did not answer the questions he had asked. But what of the threats, the intimidation, the secrecy? Are we to believe, as the government still seems to expect, that it was all over a weather balloon? For those who claim to have been eyewitnesses to whatever happened at Roswell, the events of July 1947 can never be forgotten. But until more evidence comes to the surface, the incident at Roswell is still another of the many unanswered questions in the UFO diary.